What we're going to use for a circuit to check the inductors is we're still going to feed it with a square weight because what we want to do is build what they call a tank circuit with the inductor and a known capacitor. Um, but in order to uh, not have a high um, current flow through, we're going to use a, um, one of these capacitors just to simply decouple um, the signal. So what I'm going to use is this one that seems to be the lowest value. I know we haven't measured it yet. And what we're going to do is use a capacitor. All right, and then we're going to feed that into a tank circuit. So a typical tank circuit is basically an inductor, which in this case is our unknown element, and a capacitor. All right, and then this one is the return to ground. And what we do is we measure off here. So on this side of the capacitor, we're going to do a, a fast rising edge. Um, on this side, it's just going to do this and then taper off because of this low value. What we can, or at least that's what it would normally do. But because of this tank circuit, what we're going to find is it's going to sit and then it's going to ring and slowly come down. And then when we put the next pulse, it's going to ring again and come down again. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing with this. And the period of this oscillation is the time constant of this tank circuit that we have right here. So given that we know the formula for that, so the, normally the frequency is 1 over 2 pi root of LC. All right? Now if we rearrange this formula so that we can pull out the inductance, then what we have is the um, Henry's equals the um, 1 over and it's now becomes 2 pi um, frequency squared times the capacitance. Okay, so that ends up giving us, so just rearranging this formula, that now gives us the value of the inductance in Henry's or micro Henry's, depending on how we do the math. Um, so this is what we're actually trying to achieve. So this is the, the constant, as you can see this ringing, this tank circuit, it's totally controlled by the L and the C. So if we know the C, we can derive L because we're going to measure the frequency of this oscillation. It's damped. If you were using this to actually create an oscillator, you'd put some kind of feedback with an op amp or a transistor or something that would actually keep this thing ringing constantly. Um, in our case, we're just using the Agilent 33622A to create a pulse just to start it ringing. It's a bit like tapping the edge of a bell to make it ring and it slowly decays and then you give it another tap and it rings again. And if you actually measure the frequency of the audio from the bell, you can figure out its characteristics. In this case, we're measuring the frequency of this tank circuit to derive the value of the inductor here, L, and we know what C is going to be, or we will know what C is once we do the math. Okay, so let me just build this circuit up. So what I've done is I've increased the frequency of the uh, Agilent 33622A output to a um, 100 hertz square wave again. It's still 2 volts peak to peak. Now, because of the way this thing works, it is going to um, squash the output signal quite considerably because that first capacitor uh, is going to integrate down the signal um, you know, because you've got a very low value inductance and then you've got basically a, another capacitor in series of the first one. Uh, it's going to shrink the signal that we're measuring quite a lot. So we will um, change the settings to a much larger value. And if you look at the screen here, what you see is this. I've connected channel 2 to the um, input to the circuit that we just drew, as you can see here. Um, and it's still a square wave. But what you see on the output of the circuit which was the other side of the integrating capacitor. If I just move this out of sight away a second. So it's just here at this point on the top of the LC tank circuit is where we're measuring. And all you're seeing at this level is a spike, which if you think about the normal operation of um, an inductor and capacitor, is that's, that's pretty much what you'd expect. If I increase the range now, we're down to um, 200, 100 millivolts per division. So even though we're putting in a 2 volt signal, we've only got 100 millivolts. It's jumping up and down here a little bit for some reason. But if I expand this out, and um, what you'll start to see is, I've just got to move the trigger point in here a second. You see this ringing. You're starting to see that ring that I was describing before. 
I just move this around a little bit so you can get a better view of it. And if I increase the bandwidth even further, you'll see that here is this oscillation. So this is the rising edge of the square wave going into the circuit. It starts the ringing, and if I just slide this across, you'll see that um, after, let's have a look, 10 microseconds, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 microseconds, it's disappeared. And, you know, this is running at 100 hertz, so if I just go down enough, you'll see that after um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 milliseconds, the trailing edge starts it ringing again. It's just going to kick it in the opposite direction. And then the next rising edge will kick the ring, and etc., etc. Et so if we just go back out here now and expand this, what we can actually do is measure the period of this. So I'm going to ch turn off um, channel 2 just to get it out of the way. And I'm going to uh, increase the amplitude of channel 1. We don't have to see the peak of this. We're not really interested in that. Um, just bring it into the center of the screen increase the time base so that we have a reasonable amount of the waveform on the screen uh, and just set that up so that we can actually measure the period I apologize for the noise it's um, my oscilloscope has got if I turn the bandwidth on oh, that's channel 2 um, it's picking up a little bit of noise from other things around here so I've got a lot of equipment in this room anyway let me just capture that as a just stop that running. Now I'll use the center crossing points of the um, display just to set up cursor A and B and what will happen is that the cursors when they do this measurement um, they automatically figure out what the frequency is based on the period. So if we just hover that across there, go to cursor B and so we're on the trailing edge crossing center so we go to the trailing edge crossing center here and what we get is roughly 7.52 microseconds which works out to be 132.9 kilohertz so if we write this one down as L1 and we'll say it's 132.9 um, kilohertz 132.9 kilohertz and now we'll just go to inductor 2 and we'll repeat the same exercise We'll keep the same capacitor because it probably will be okay for that. And we'll just plug this one in instead. Um, I put a little pin header on this just to make it easier to get it to plug in. We'll let this run again. Obviously the period has changed now because this is a much bigger inductor. And if I reduce the uh, scales down again, you'll see that this again is doing that ringing exercise, okay? So there's nothing different about the way this circuit is working. It's just the periods and the amplitudes it's basically resonating this thing so if I just put that back across increase the period and we'll just stop that and remeasure so cursor A wrong adjustment um, go to the rising side this time so we'll put that on the cross uh, cursor B and we'll move this one across all right, so this time we've got 44.2 microseconds. So L2 is 44.2 microseconds, which equates to 22.62 kilohertz. All right, now um, this third inductor, which I've got no idea what kind of value it is. Um, I was building this one. If you notice the size of it, uh, I was actually working on trying to build a uh, cat flap that uses an RFID chip on the cat collar to detect the cat presence and unlock the cat flap so I had to make a coil that was big enough and I'm basically uh, at the time I had nothing to measure the actual original inductors to see what value they were now with this I'll be able to go back and measure it but just for now I plug this one in and we just want to find out what value it is so let's just go back to running again and well it looks like pretty close to that one, but uh, we'll find out. Let's um, just verify it's behaving the same way, and as you can see, it is. It's just ringing the bell kind of circuit there, so all right, that's as good as any. So now let's just use the falling edges this time. So let's go to cursor A, adjust that to the um, zero crossover point, which is pretty much there. 
and we'll adjust cursor B um, which is just about there so that's about 34.4 microseconds so we'll call this L3 and it's 34.4 microseconds which equates to 29.07 kilohertz so that's 29.07 kilohertz so given these now we should be able to calculate the capacitors first and then go on to calculating the values of the inductors so let's get up the Excel spreadsheet and do some math